Good morning, Simon. Welcome to my podcast, One for the Road. And there's been a big gap in the seasons, but you're starting episode one. And it's a real joy to have you on today. And it's nice and early here. It's 7 a.m. Us early risers, <laughs> you know, it's get, get this done. How are you, mate? I'm good, and you'll be proud of me. Even though it's a, an early start, I still got out and and have managed to get for a run. So yeah, feeling really? feeling yeah, feeling feeling in top form. So amazing. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I've been up since uh, four a.m. Um, because wow. I just woke up uh, and I spent all day at the hospital with my dad. And by the time I got home last night, it's a five-hour drive. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to have to set the alarm for you. And I didn't need to because <laughs> just recently I've been waking up before where normally I say with people at 5 a.m. It was 4. So, but your story is incredible, mate. Yeah. And uh, I'm really grateful you joined me today. And as per usual, we not like to start it off at right at the beginning. So if you could go from there, that'd be brilliant. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think, I think with, with, I guess regards to my childhood and everything I had I had a pretty stable childhood uh you know really loving parents um and you know things 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 were were going well I probably uh had a, a weight problem from a from an early age I think that's fair to say I I loved my food um and you know was probably on the larger side of 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 most children and 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 maybe bullied a, a, a little bit for that but but not not extravagantly if 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 that makes sense and i and i wasn't huge at, at that stage um and really where alcohol started coming into the picture was you know sadly i lost i lost my mum uh i was 15 years old um she'd had a, a sort of three-year battle with with cancer and um and, and and passed away and you know really that was that was the time almost uh, whether it was kind of luck or or uh, luck's maybe the wrong word but alcohol entered my life pretty much that day and um I remember a friend heard of the of the passing of my mum and said look would you like to spend a little bit of time together she she passed away about quarter to three in the morning and and he he came round and, and picked me up about three o'clock in the afternoon and we we walked up to a bench and he, he pulled out some hooch uh you know everyone loves a good hooch right and um we sat there and and, and we drank a few of those and instantly I felt this almost kind of relief and and um you know that that was really how alcohol kind of or, or certainly the feeling of alcohol um blocking out emotions really started in my in my life and 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 that and that continued really it it, it took various shapes and and forms um but I it, it was not a healthy way to start I think that's I think that's fair to say and I tended to drink to numb emotions um I, I remember one one you know emotion that really really stuck with me which was when my mum died they kind of gave her parents her parents were still alive she was 43 and they lived in France and and they were due to come over by by ferry and um in those days mobile phones for 70 year old French grandparents weren't really a thing so um they came over on the boat and um uh, late at night and uh um she actually passed away while they were on the overnight ferry and i was sent to to um kind of pick them up uh with a with a family friend and i remember them coming off the boat and they both came off and and i and and i had to tell them i had to to say look your daughter's your daughter's passed away and i just remember it that feeling hitting me so hard and um alcohol was just this almost beautiful way of of kind of numbing that out all the time mm. um and and every time i would drink it would be like oh i don't i don't really have to think about that um or if i do have to think about it it was almost through a kind of rose tinted effect um and, and that's and that's and that's where my kind of journey with with alcohol started and then you go through your teens and you go you know university and um 
uh you know i always i always drank i i noticed very early on that i drank in a different way to the people that i was surrounded by you know people could go oh let's go for one or, or let's just you know go for a beer for me if 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 i was going to start i was i was going to finish and i would i would drink pretty much nine times out of 10 to to oblivion or 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 sleep um it's really and, interesting and, actually yeah. what you say about that because you like me um started off your drinking career running in a way right because of the traumatic experience of your mum passing but also what i picked up on was when you said growing up as a kid you were heavier and i was i mean i used to love my peanut butter sandwiches right my that's all i'd ever have my packed lunch every single day mum would say oh do you want ham and tomato do you want cheese and pickle no peanut butter sandwiches like doorsteps yeah. but i was just that kid that was podgy you know like the puppy fat do you remember that quote yeah oh you're a bit of puppy fat you wear that off when you're older and that but you know, like I, I did get bullied and called fatty and and stuff like that, and that plays on your mind a lot growing up, doesn't it? And yeah, you know, similar to not not um comparing to your mum passing, unfortunately, but my mum left me at fourteen as well, and it was that jolt in my nervous system that at that age I wasn't emotionally developed at all. Yeah, I wasn't streetwise. I had no idea. You know, I was like looked after. And then when she left, it was that that horrible jolt in my nervous system. And as you say, the alcohol just was like a magic tablet for me because all those feelings I didn't understand at all. And then dealing with my dad's emotions like you had to do was all of a sudden took all the edges off of it. And it's yeah. like, oh, where has this miracle been laying all these years? You know what I mean? And yeah. we both went off running, didn't we, with alcohol? Yeah. Yeah, and I and and I I absolutely relate to that, and I think I think your experience is probably is probably very similar because it's it's those emotions of having to fend for yourself a, a little bit, and and I think my you know my dad continued with with work for some time, and his his work took him internationally. So, you know, from a food perspective, I was you know fifteen starting to cook for myself making all the making all the wrong choices with with that and and the kind of alcohol and and food journey um went hand in hand and and i found you know a bag of m&ms um was a great way of kind of dealing with my stress a bag of m&ms and a, a couple of beers was an even was an even better way and they kind of went hand in hand you know because when you drink you feel like you want to eat more you you wake up with a hangover you want to eat you know, uh, greasy food. Mm -hmm. And and this thing kind of, and by the time I was 21, I mean, I was already 20, I, I was over 20 stone, you know, before I, before I'd hit 21, I was probably 21 stone at, at that stage. So, you know, I went to university as a very big man. Um, and, and with that, then I guess becomes this, you know, you're really insecure um, uh, about how you look, you know, you're insecure, but you can't buy clothes from normal shops. You're kind of buying them from places like High and Mighty. And, 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 and all these insecurities kind of add up. And the drink, you know, was just a beautiful, uh, was just the easy way to get rid of those, those insecurities for me. Um, and so my journey really from that kind of first drink as a 15 year old never really stopped I never did a dry January I I you know at best I might have had a couple of nights off here here or there uh due to sickness or or something like that but it it really kind of continued and and you know I always felt that bigger size and and bigger man the, the way I should be is I should be the life and soul of the party that was my unique selling point if you like to people um is that you know i could get a party going or or whatever but um yeah so so it 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 was it was not a great not a great place to to be in and at times i managed to lose a bit of weight here lose a bit of weight there um you know get on a bit of a health kick but they never stuck and i couldn't i couldn't work that out i couldn't work out why they they wouldn't stick 
Um, and every time I started to feel a little bit better about myself, um, I then go and start drinking more again or, or Sabotage whatever. So I, it. Yeah. Yeah. It's an odd I think cycle, that's... isn't it? You know, like I can really relate to that. It's like, um, I, I've battled with my weight all my life as well. Cause I'm a big bloke. Um, and I could kind of carry it off a little bit, you know? Yeah. But it was that cycle of, I need to sort it out. And then I would sort it out a little bit and think, oh, I've lost half a stone now, so I can reward myself with actually having a pizza. And, yeah. and then it crept up really quickly. And I always put it down to lack of self-worth, lack of self-esteem is why we get into all this. You know, like it's that comfort feeling, isn't it? It's that odd emotion wrapped around eating and drinking. Um, yeah. But the thing is with food is you have to eat. And yeah. that's the difference between giving up alcohol because for me, I had to make it non-negotiable that I yeah. just can't drink. So I've said before that like, I always look at it like I'm allergic, like I've got a nut allergy, that if I had one drink, I would basically die because it would kill me. Um, with food, you have to manage it. Um, and if you like your food and it gives yeah. you that emotional release, it's bloody hard, isn't it? Yeah, and I really, I really, I suppose... You know, as you get older, you get wiser. But I really started to, you know, in my late 30s, I really started to notice a kind of correlation between um, a bad day at work. Um, you know, I, I was traveling quite a lot for, for work. I was I was at my peak. I was, you know, just just under 22 stone. Um, and I was kind of traveling quite a bit from work and I, I started noticing this correlation between a bad day and my reactions. And if, if I'd had a bad meeting or someone had shouted at me or I felt this big, I would instantly kind of reach for something, whether it's food or, or alcohol, I would instantly reach for something to kind of take the edge off. And and that that developed a little bit further. I, I started I suffered from a bad back for a long time, you know, too much weight, uh, not looking after myself. Um, and I started taking painkillers. I started taking codeine and and very similar effect. Um, you know, codeine, you uh, I took it through uh, uh, sulpidine so you can you can get it off the shelf. And it had the, the exact same effect, this kind of numbing without the walking funny if if that makes sense that you get with alcohol but it was kind of this numbing calming uh, uh, effect uh that would wear off you know pretty quickly but it was just another way of of taking away from that um i guess feeling feeling not adequate um in in life and and so yeah by the time i was kind of 38 i was taking a lot of codeine i was drinking a lot um you know a saturday would would kind of start with waking up with a hangover taking some codeine in the in the morning um and then finding the first possible reason to 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 drink whether that be pretending that i was going to cook a lovely uh roast or a, a lovely meal that takes five hours to stew and i'd have to stand in the kitchen with a bottle of you know uh wine to do it yeah. and i and I'd, I'd just drink all all, all day and I, I just was yeah and and I suppose the thing that kept the and it still hurts me it still hurts me even now is um you know, putting my children to bed in their in their early years putting them to bed was a nuisance because actually as as many people know children putting children to bed can take a bit of time can take an hour can can take an hour and a half and and that meant you know I had to go upstairs um and I couldn't you know take my wine with me or or whatever sometimes I did uh but I couldn't exactly stop bedtime and go down to to get a fill up um and and you know I still feel incredibly guilty about that but it but it's an addiction it's it's mm -hmm. and I I never realized I was addicted um uh, I probably did realize but I I didn't maybe I didn't admit it to myself early enough that um that I had a problem, but yeah, I look back at those times with, with a lot of guilt. I can understand that. Um, because for me, um, when I was drinking, 
um, the more I drank, the more I wanted to be on my own with it because I'd reached a certain level that any kind of external noise, albeit kids, phone calls, people wanting to ask me anything, is like, uh, no, I'm in this zone now that I'm going to get even more distant yeah. and solitary. So I used to get incredibly irritable, agitated. So when you say about the bedtime thing, and you know that the bottle of wine's downstairs, and then you start to lose that momentum of your drinking, yeah. that's when you start to go a little bit loopy and, and, and you get irritable and agitated uh, and impatient, you know, and the yeah. kids pick up on it. And then you go, do you know what? I can't do this. Just so you can go downstairs and get get the wine again, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, I, uh, I probably haven't said that out loud too too many too many times, but um, and and I suppose that's been the beautiful thing about mo moving this all forward is is um, you know, alcohol took over so much, just just took over every weekend, most nights of the week, it, it took up so much of my time, um, and and that's what's been so beautiful about leaving it leaving it behind um has been how much it's just opened up my life in, yeah. in so many different areas yeah but you know what mate i remember a time where um my son came up he was driving by then and uh i've probably told this story before but i want to reassure you how i felt at the time was that um i i was cooking a meal for him and i was drinking some stellas in the kitchen Right. And it, and he just newly passed his driving test. And um, I was making him a mixed grill. He loves, <clears throat> you know, a big, big meal. Um, and then I realized actually we was going to watch a film and I couldn't just sit there like opening cans of Stella up. So I sat there for about 20 minutes watching the film, but then I started to come down again of the yeah. Stellas. So I said, look, I'm going to, I'm going to um, get a pint of water. Do you want anything? He went, no, I'm all right, dad. Paul's film went in and I've got a pint of vodka and tonic. Yeah. But so by by the time the film was halfway through, I was drunk. And he said, do you know what, Dad? I think I'm going to go home. I've got things to do in that. And I thought, God, I'm pissed. Yeah. And But how it made me feel was that he must think I don't want to spend time with him. But it wasn't that at all. It was my addiction. You know, like yeah. I needed... The best thing for me to have done that night was not drink at all, which I yeah. feel ashamed about. But when looking back, I realized that actually I was so into my addiction to alcohol that I just couldn't go a day without it. And I have empathy for that man um, that I, I wasn't yeah. well. You know, it, it wasn't something I was asked or it kind of attitude. I wasn't well. I needed it. I needed it. Otherwise, I'd have gone mad kind of in yeah. my head at the time, you know. And I just hope so many people relate to that and don't judge because this is what I try and put out here that, it, you know, like it's hard to understand if you've never been there, but when you're there, yeah, it's so different, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I think you just, one thing, you know, through this journey, a lot of people have, you know, what's, what's really powerful is, is how much you, you don't realize how many people are in the same situation. You just, you just don't, you just think, you know, that you're, uh a bit of an exception to the rule and you you can't drink properly and everybody else is an adult and and they're able to do it sensibly you know whether it's your friends around you or or whatever and what's been what's been so interesting is once you open up and 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 talk about it is the is the amount of people that are thinking exactly the same thing as you whether it's on linkedin or 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 wherever you know people sending me messages saying look i can't really talk to anyone about this would you would you mind if we had a chat yeah uh, these these are people i don't even even know you know and and i always say i always say yes because i suppose um i i know how it feels and and you know it's it's a it's a pretty scary place on your own and then you wake up in yeah. the morning anxious about it and you know, it's you not maybe something don't... we talk about, you know, no. like it, it's just that there's still a lot of stigma around it. Yeah. You know? Like we talk about mental health and the latest buzzword ADHD, OCD, yeah. you know, autism. We, we all talk about that, but it's the elephant in the room still. 
no yeah. one says, you know what, I, I'm going to come out now and just say I've got a real problem with alcohol. And you don't have to be um, the the brown bag on the bench anymore. You know, like there's certain levels that can give you anxiety, poor sleep, um, yeah. affect relationships. And this is why these conversations are so important to help people to remove the shame around it and, and be open about it. Totally. Totally. And I think whether it's, you know, podcast conversations or, or, you know, people's Instagram or uh, books that I've, that I've read, um, those have been the most powerful tools for me because in, in almost every story that I've listened to or every person that I followed, I might not relate to everything that they've been through, but, you know, 99 times out of 100 I've related to little bits of their of their story and I thought Do you know what actually Simon it's it it's okay it was it's it's an addictive substance that you know um you got addicted through be, you know because of trauma because of the feeling and and you maybe just weren't aware in the in the hole that you were you were going down and so I that has been huge for me the 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 community if you like um and and it's not necessarily people i talk to face to face but even just being able to understand that other people are going through the same thing um and and have had their struggles is is a real place of of learning for me mm. because i've learned so much from other people mm. um that's wonderful yeah um what point in your drinking then did you start to think things have got to change and and how at that point how old was you and how much was you drinking yeah so um really I I started I, it was it was my late 30s with the with the children uh the children were were pretty young I've got I've got two beautiful children who are now 13 and nine um so kind of in my late 30s they were nine and 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 four maybe a bit younger than that and I kind of I the putting them to bed thing and and realizing that I couldn't uh I wasn't being a great dad, put it put it that way. I'd I'd spend Sunday hungover rather than taking them out to the park or or whatever it might be. Um I started to a few people started to question my drinking. Um my wife um i started to i started to lose my temper quite a quite a fair bit i i wasn't particularly proud of the human i was um the codeine again my wife saw that a couple of other people started noting that that i worked with and so kind of the walls started to to come in a little bit i started hiding things so uh, things that I would hide as an example is if I was drinking, I'd try and grab a massive glass of white wine quickly before anyone else saw or or whatever to get me started. Then I knew, right, I can have that. I'll feel a bit better and then I can go a little bit slower or or, or whatever. Um, so the, there was there was kind of a, a, a bit of a pattern and, and, and people starting to, to, to kind of question me. But really, I suppose it, it, it came down to to two major things and one was um i was at work uh, you know i'd had a really big night the the night before no no particular reason it wasn't a birthday or a thing i i just had a, and and i work in the hospitality industry and and i think some of the difficulty with that is um that certainly hasn't helped me over the years food or drink um and i know a lot of people in hospitality struggle and I, th I think your I, I was working at that time in a in a really nice hotel with an amazing bar and um, I'm seeing people drink all day long and in, enjoying themselves. And so at the end of my day, I think, you know, I'll I'll have one or I'll have two or, or whatever. And uh, yeah, so a, a, another big night, which, you know, a big night was probably six. I, I, I like starting with a pint. It was probably you know, five or six pints. If I was staying away for work, I'd maybe have a couple of things out the minibar to get started. 
um and then i'd i'd probably finish off with with wine um uh wasn't really into spirits or or never never have been um so i woke up that uh, next day with a with a particularly bad hangover and i remember a, a colleague i uh, he was like a porter you know for the hotel so if you needed anything this guy could get it for you and I remember saying to him, could you could you nip up in the in the car to get me some um, sulpidine, extra strong? And I'd asked him this a few times. So he kind of he kind of got the message and, and he came back with it and he gave it to me. And he said, look, Simon, it's, it's none of my business. Um, but I know you've got two young kids and the way you're going, you're going to kill yourself. And, and this is a guy I still talk to now, a guy called Gary, a Scottish chap, probably in his mid 60s. And I remember as he gave me the, the 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 codeine, I remember his words just absolutely hit me. Mm. Because I suppose advice from your wife, you feel that's maybe just someone nagging you. But this was the, this was the first time that perhaps someone who doesn't know me that well is noticing something about me um, that that is is not a good thing. And I remember driving home that night. And I thought, oh my, you know, I have I have got to do something about this. Um, because I was I was at my biggest. I was, you know, abusing every part of my body, food, my diet was awful, energy drinks to kind of pet me up or or whatever. Just just the whole thing was was not good. And so um interesting, interesting relationship, I guess, but I, I had on a couple of times maybe tried to broach it with my wife and and you know say that I that I had a problem, but um those conversations I, I couldn't be totally honest, I think, and 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 you know, I was nervous about those conversations and so they kind of petered off. But this time I felt really, really strongly about doing something. And so I actually I actually sent her an email. And, and I texted her afterwards thinking she's either going to leave me um, or or hopefully she'll she'll come out and, and support me. And, and um, you know, her, her response was amazing. Uh, she she read the email, you know, the next time I saw her, she she put her arms around me and, and uh, I feel quite emotional talking about it. And and she she just said, uh, we're, we're going to sort this out. We're going to we're, we're going to sort this out. And um you know, my dad, um, we, we kind of talked it through with my dad as well. Uh, and he was he was incredibly helpful. And um, those were the only two people I, I discussed it with um, at that at that time. And it just started this this kind of train, you know, train of momentum. And, and, and I think that's that's something I'd say to anyone out there. You feel so lost you feel so ashamed you want to lock yourself away and just drink more and 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 not talk to anyone and th that moment was absolute relief yeah it was it was it was i still think about it now it was like wow i've just shared my problem and someone's said to me it's okay and they're they're going to love me anyway and and they they're going to put their arms around me and that and and that since that day i've i've just never looked back i've i've just never looked back and and it's it's set in it's set in motion a, a yeah a pretty amazing um i know story, the really. domino effect is incredible and they're starting yeah. with gary he must have been thinking that for a while and then going to your car to get it yeah there was that probably that itch so i need to say something to him because yeah. he obviously cared right and you could have easily said to him, mind your own fucking business. Right? I could have, yeah. But it's a bit like my friend Piers when he when he kind of did that collaboration. Rather than say it to me, mate, you look terrible. You need to stop drinking. He said, why don't you join me for three months? Yeah. And it may, it was that 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 pinnacle part where my life completely changed. Yeah. Like that one sentence like you. And your wife's reaction as well is goes to show the love and support she's given you there, you know. And as you say, she's yeah. gone, do you know what? I've had enough of you, mate, and I'm off. Yeah. It's incredible. 
So, yeah. so what happened after that? So we kind of we we kind of talked it we kind of talked it through, you know, started looking into things and and I suppose with work, you know, there was this feeling of maybe I should leave work and 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 that sort of thing, but um the, the first thing I started to to do was, you know, I, I knocked the painkillers on the head literally that day straight away. And I didn't, you know, the thought of never drinking again felt horrific. Um, so I, I, you know, didn't commit to that at that point, but I, I joined a gym uh, next to work uh it it wasn't a your traditional gym i was so embarrassed about my weight and everything but it was a it was a boxing gym real spit and sawdust boxing gym right next to the hotel i think it was like five quid a month to join <laughs> um but it opened at 6 a.m and no one seemed to go in early in the morning so i kind of was there with this guy who was the kind of boxing coach and a few other people um, and that was a that was a huge relief. Smashing the the, the pads uh, seemed to to you know uh, just gave me this really nice effect in the morning. And he was he was a real no nonsense character. His name's Wayne, and um, he just if you turned up hungover, you know he'd he'd obliterate you into the ground even further. So I, I I just started to get into this pattern where I wouldn't I wouldn't drink in the week. Um, you know, I found that I found that so hard at first. I mean, so hard getting getting home. It, it started making me go home earlier from work, which was a, which was a good thing. But I remember the first month I've, I've never really been one to go to bed too early. But the first month. I, I felt very depressed at times. And sometimes I just wanted to go to bed. I mean, there would have been times I went to bed at, at seven, half past nice. seven. Just get the and day I, out of the way. Just just get the day done. Um, and when I always when I woke up in the morning, I felt, okay, that's really good. I'm going to go, uh, you know, I, I got through that. So so those early nights became a little bit of a mechanism of, of kind of getting through it. Um and I and I had some pretty I, I think it was so many things coming up to the to the fore. I you know, I had some pretty emotional experiences evenings where, you know, I just wanted to cry my eyes out. Um and I at first I said, right, I'm allowed to drink on a Friday and Saturday evening. But I noticed this, I, I noticed how good I felt in the week. And then I would would have a drink on a Friday and Saturday and all of a sudden I'd feel awful again. And I, and I think once I started noticing how good I felt without alcohol, I noticed more how bad I felt with it. Mm. Uh, and so that that was that was quite powerful. And 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 so then I was then I said, right now I'm only going to drink on a Saturday. I stopped. I stopped a Friday. And this was all over a period quite quickly, actually, over a period of uh, about three months. And I checked in with various things. I used drink free days. It was an NHS app. And I, I really got into like ticking the, 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 the buttons, if you like. I started logging it in my work diary. I found that really helpful. So if I had a day where I didn't touch um, booze, I would log it in my diary and, and turn the day green. And I found that really helpful. It was kind of like these mental things that. Yeah. That, um, and then I realized you know, I, I was getting into my exercise, I was getting fitter. And then I realized the Saturday was obliterating the the progress. Um, and I'd wake up on a Sunday, and I'd feel worse than I did after five days in the gym back to back. So I, I started, I was, I, I started knocking it on a head on a on a Saturday. And the way I did that is I just kept myself so busy. Um, and my wife still laughs now, she's never seen the house so clean. I mean, <laughs> You know, I would wash the dishes, I'd go out for walks, I'd I'd find anything to do that that stopped me from drinking alcohol. And that and that started to manifest itself more into exercise. Um, so I'd exercise for longer, I would um, you know, do it more days of the week. Um and and when when you talk about momentum and 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 sobriety i think i think that's something that is 
was just so powerful on, on my journey was that um this this kind of the ball starts rolling pretty slowly at first and those first few days are you know pretty black and pretty miserable and then you start getting this chink of light mm -hmm. that you start to to feel better about yourself and then that that darkness it doesn't it doesn't go away completely but it really starts to fade and more light comes through and more light comes through and i just started to feel incredible and the weight started to drop off part of the boxing thing was it is this kind of accountability board and I, I you know you had to write your weight down every week and I'm there with these pro boxers and I'm losing more weight than them uh fair enough I was from a from a worse starting point but um you know that that felt really powerful and and it, you know there's a, a pro boxer in Southampton I'm still in touch with him now he's going on to do great things and I remember him coming up to me and he said you're le you're you're an example to all of us and I said, what? He said, the way you train, the way you, you know, turn up every single day and, and don't moan and just get on with it. You're an example to all of us. You're inspiring me. Mm. And I thought, oh, that's a, that's a bit weird. And then I, at work, I just, I just got better at, at work. My, my leadership style changed. Um, my mood changed. I, I felt much calmer about things. And then probably the best thing that I've ever experienced in in sobriety was this element of peace. And I, I whether I would maybe experienced when I was little or a thing, but I certainly hadn't experienced it since I was a 15 year old boy and, and, and right up until 38 was just I'd have these moments kind of wash over me that I just felt so peaceful. I just felt at peace with who I was it, it, it normally it would be when I was surrounded by my children or, or something like that and I was doing something with them and I was invested in with them and and it was just the, the most remarkable feeling better than any high I'd got in the last 25 years from any drugs um and it would it would come it comes and goes you know, there are there are times that it, it, it's not always there and things get stressful, but it but it it, it comes back, um, you know, regularly. And yeah, and I, I guess I got you could say I got addicted to the to the feeling of, of you know, having a stomach that didn't hurt, yeah. waking up, waking up, um, putting on clothes where I looked in the mirror and started feeling proud of, of the person that was in front of that of that mirror um and you know people you know eight nine stone is quite a lot to shift and to shift it in borderline two years people notice a a, a a big big difference and and we talk about the amount of people struggling with um you know alcohol addiction the amount of people struggling with obesity is 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 the same and you know so many people wanted wanted support and help Can you hear me? Sorry, mate. Yeah, don't worry. Um, I was meant to mute myself and because I coughed and I muted you. So oh, don't worry. Don't worry. But we don't can worry. break it there. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, let's break it there, right? Sorry, yeah. Danny, for this. Um, so you did this when you were 38, but then yeah. a curveball happened um, in that process was lockdown. Yeah. What happened? <laughs> How, how um, long into your sobriety was you when that happened? Yeah, so uh, about five months into my uh, kind of into my journey, um, sobriety happened, uh, uh, lockdown happened. So um, and that and that brought stress. Um, you know, I was running a business at the at the time. Um, and, you know, it was it was a real curveball because lots of my friends were doing kind of quiz nights with wine or wine nights, um, you know. And so it really did um, 
yeah, it 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 puts some added it puts some added pressure on. But I think, thank goodness, I'd made a move before COVID because uh, before lockdown. Because I think otherwise lockdown might have been might have been the end of me. Mm. Um, because actually, I noticed enough of a positive change that I was I was going to stick with it. And because work was so stressful, mm. I I decided that. Um, actually, I employ 450 people in this business, and the hotel industry is going to go is is going to be very very challenged. And I need to be at my absolute best every day to get this hotel group through the the other side. And and that single point of focus was really important to me. And then I had my exercise, which I had to change. Couldn't go boxing anymore. I had to change. And that's how I got into triathlon. I had to change that to running and to, and to cycling. And I found that very therapeutic. Um, and so that's how it, it kind of evolved, really. Yeah. I mean, when I stopped drinking, it was 2019. So January. So quite a similar time. Yeah. And in that year... Similar to you, um, I got into exercise pretty quickly because I was 21 stone. And I said to Piers, who had said to me, why don't you join me in the three months? He was doing a charity bike ride um, in the September to London to Paris. And right. I said, oh, I'll do that. And he looked at me and he didn't say it, but I knew what he was thinking. He was thinking, your bike's going to break, mate, if you get on that saddle. Yeah. But I persevered with it. And we used to go on a turbo trainer every morning. He had a double garage. And we right. had this app. And we would, some mornings we would talk, some mornings we wouldn't. And I'd do an hour morning at 6 a.m. every morning. Yeah. Gradually, the weights started to come off. And we did the London to Portsmouth um, thing. That nearly killed me because it was a North Down, South Downs. Uh, and I've got a train back um, and then London to Brighton. And then we did the London to Paris. And I always remember riding in past the Eiffel Tower thinking, oh, my God, like it, I was, what, eight months into my sobriety. So it's, and you changed your life. Like you, literally you... everything had changed. I think um, I had held my first event because that's what really helped me. When you talk about connection, I went to an event. And I met some amazing people there. And I remember getting on the train after thinking, God, everyone's so normal. Because yeah. I thought people that didn't drink were aliens, you know? Yeah. Weirdos. Um, that's what you think. Weirdos, isn't it? boring. <laughs> and, you know, and I remember that. And I'd held my first event in East London and there was nearly a hundred people turned up. A woman flew from Germany. Um, I started like making connections in the sober community. I started talking about my own mental health and you know, I'm a Croydon lad. Um, what you see is what you get kind of thing. And people yeah. liked it, you know. There was no bullshit around it. And I'm of a certain age as well. And it, all these little things added together, like it's like a recipe, isn't it, in a big cooking yeah. pot. And you add them all in, these ingredients, and they'll start to blend. And then you start to get the, the bigger picture. Um, and I've never looked back like you. But I haven't, yeah. you know, like you've, you've done the Iron Man thing and... I admire you so much because that's my limiting beliefs. Uh, I climbed two mountains last year, so I've done that. Uh, I've done quite a few challenges, but my limiting beliefs are like I wouldn't be able to do that. Um, and it's weird, isn't it? Like what your whole mindset around your achievement. And a lot of people, they don't think they can stop drinking. Yeah. And I always say, a bit like your Iron Man, right? You didn't start off running a 10K off the bat, right? You have to build up to it. And it's a bit like yeah. sobriety. You have to go for the process of the, the thought pattern of, for me, it was repeatedly saying to myself, I need to sort this out. I need to do something about it. And it was yeah. kind of planting that seed. And then it was the deciding to do something about it. And then it was doing something about it and sticking with it. Um, and making it non-negotiable. Then it was finding the community. Then it was educating myself. Then all these things losing the weight, yeah. and it started to formulate. And then 
it, it become easier because I put all these things in. But from when from the starting point, it all seems too big, like your Iron Man, isn't it? It's like yeah. you at 21 stone at 38 would never believe in a million years that you could ever be an Iron Man, right? Exactly. Never not in a I couldn't I could not get up the stairs without being out of breath. Yeah. You know, I couldn't and and I still remember the first session in the in the boxing gym. You know, I went on the treadmill. And all I could do was a walk. I couldn't. I couldn't do a run. Mm. Not in. Not in a in a million years. And you're so right about those. It's those habits. It, it's just. And and that's those have become, you know, killer for me in the sense that it's it's just slowly building in habits and and, you know, sobriety has allowed me to be consistent. Mm. So it's allowed me to think consistently. It's allowed me to get up each day and, and be consistent and, and carry on going after things that I want to without having to uh, put aside four days to recover or, or whatever it, whatever it is. Mm. And I, and, and I think, you know, the, the, the Ironman funny enough came about in a, in a bit of a weird way, which was, you know, uh, my brother is, my brother's had a very different journey to me. He's always been quite fit and healthy um he, drink was never something you know he drank a bit in his in his earlier years but he he's he's not a big he doesn't drink at all now but you know he he definitely didn't drink a, 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 to the way I did so he had a very very different relationship and I remember him saying to me and here I am at you know however many stone and he's saying to me I'm thinking of doing this Iron Man thing and I kind of looked at myself and thought yeah I'd yeah, it's a bit embarrassing. I'm not I'm not going to do that. And I remember kind of getting through, you know, I started to run 4K, 5K, 6K. And I was like, OK, I'm, I'm, I'm getting better here. I'm not I'm not perfect, but I'm getting better. And similar to you, I had a bike in the garage that I do every morning. And I just started to get a bit more confident. And it was coming up to 25 years since my mum died. And I thought to myself, right maybe I could do something to celebrate, you know, the passing and that would keep me really accountable. And maybe I could do something to, to celebrate because I didn't want to mourn. I wanted to celebrate 20, 25 years since my, mm. my mum died. And that, and that was about, you know, about six, nine months out, I think. And um, I thought even better, my brother hasn't done it yet. And so, you know, being the competitive person I am, I thought that would that would you know lay a real marker in the in the sand. And um, I remember the first people I said, "Oh, I'm going to try that." They said, "Simon, you'll kill yourself. You're absolutely stupid. You're in no fit shape to to try that." Um, and that fueled me, the 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 self doubt. Um, and I trained. I trained. I would say borderline perfectly. I didn't miss a session I got up every single day whether it was you know you get these plans and and of how to train for an Ironman and I I, I got one and you know it, whether it was a four-hour cycle or a uh, thing and I I trained to exactly to the specification um I raised money for a for a charity called Elabore which was a um a, a really special charity you know helping helping people with addiction and um it just it just snowballed and then I, I don't I, there was a late there's a lady called Chrissy Wellington she's the uh but most famous triathlete probably of all time certainly British um and um I I read her book and and reading is another thing that, that's helped me so much whether it's you know Annie Grace this naked mind you talk about learning through sobriety or William Porter alcohol explained um, and I read this book by Chrissy Wellington, Wellington, I think it's called Learn to Fly or, or something like that. But um, that book was just amazing to me. It was like she was an ordinary individual who didn't really have much of an athletic background, but then went on to achieve the, the most amazing things in these sports. And, and in sobriety, you start to get more confident about talking to people and, and things. So I just dropped her a note, just an email very, very quickly said, I read your book, thought it was brilliant. Thanks so much. Really inspired me. Uh, and she wrote back literally within an hour saying, oh, what are you training for? What do you do? So I told her the whole story. 
you know, she sent me books, signed copies. Um, she did a quote for my, the, uh, and, you know, all of a sudden she said, well, I'm going to be really rooting for you on the day. And she sent me a voice note on the day. Wow. And that, and that's, and that's the thing is that once you start talking to people and you, and you start being open and I, and I started feeling comfortable. I remember one night in a, in a restaurant, I, I found it hard to go out at first. I didn't want to, but I, I got more confident as, as time went by. And I sat in this restaurant with about 40 hoteliers and the, the, the waiter came along and said, right, beers for everyone, da, da, da. And I said, no, I'm, I'm fine. Thanks. Just water for me. And there was, I was in a little group of around six people and I'd felt that situation a bit awkward. And, and one of them opposite me said to me, oh, do you not, why are you not having a beer? Do you not drink? And normally I'd just go, oh no, I don't really drink or so, or I was embarrassed about it. And this time I thought, F it. Mm. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just going to open up and say what, what the scenario is. And before I knew it, all six of them were like asking me question after question, like, you know, oh, so does it feel, but you know, does it, and how have you done it? And how have you done that? And, and I remember one of the guys emailed me the next day and said, look, I can't tell you, thank you so much. Cause I've been, I've been really questioning my drinking and you've given me so much confidence um, about potentially being able to tackle it. And, you know, the momentum with the Ironmans and, and, and that all built, um, I went on to do a second one and, uh, help some colleagues, uh, train for that as well. Um, and my wife said to me, you know, you should talk about, you should talk about your journey because lots of people were messaging me and things. She said, but you should, you should think about, you know, talking about it. And, um, I thought, okay, I'll, I'll give it a try. And I remember, and this is how I kind of got into keynote speaking and, and, you know, I thought, right, how do I, how do I start? I've, I've got literally no idea. I, you know, four years ago, I wouldn't want to stand up in front of people because I was ashamed of, of how I am. So let's let's just start. And I thought I'll start with a really small audience. So I called an old work colleague and I said she had a cinema in her hotel in, in Covent Garden. And I said, look, could I come and do a talk for your staff about my journey? She said, Simon, I'd love that. Come come up. And so I did it. And it was terrible. Oh, my oh, word. Yeah. It, was, <laughs> it was so terrible. I was petrified. My leg was shaking uncontrollably. Um, I had to read my notes pretty much verbatim. But I filmed it. I put a little camera at the at the back and I filmed it. And as painful as it was, I watched it back. And I thought, you know what, just like you couldn't run 500 yeah. meters. Um, this is your starting point. That's all it is. It's It's your starting point. And just try and get better. And so yeah. I did more and I, I I did more. And that and that kind of and I got better and I got better really quickly. Mm. And and kind of the momentum just grew. And then I had people starting, I took a few pictures, and then I had people started asking me, Oh, will you come along and do one for us? And I thought, yeah. And then they said, How much do you charge? I said, hang on a minute here. I wasn't thinking of doing this for 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 money. Um, and I kind of carried on my my normal work at the at the same time and that and that was just amazing and then you know amazon reached out and said would you we're, we're doing our yearly graduation there's going to be 500 people in a room it's going to be streamed to 21 countries will you come and do we've heard that your keynote's really good and there was a friend who'd sort of recommended me and so then i went up to amazon head office and i was the keynote speaker for and and i've just i've done about 70 of them now and um just absolutely love it and and you the reaction you get about just leaving yourself and this is what i think attracts so many people to to your instagram and to your story is that you have just been so vulnerable you have just literally opened yourself up and told some of your deepest darkest secrets and and that that's what my speaking is it's it's the same thing it's it's getting up on the stage and and people come up to me afterwards and i i, I really like it because um i had one event and the, the kind of host came up to me and he said look i just don't want you to be offended this group of people never ask any questions afterwards so there'll probably be an awkward silence afterwards 
and they won't ask any questions. I said, OK, no, no problem. Thank you for letting me know. Jeepers, they had to they had to stop it because so many people were asking questions and I was going over my time. Oh my. Um, and and again, it's it's because people are people are interested, whether it's the 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 food, whether it's sobriety, whether it's painkillers, people, everybody is suffering from yeah. from something. Yeah. And and being able to relate to people who who are willing to talk about that um is is really powerful. And and a, a, one of the things I'm proud of to say that I've done is helped other helped other yeah. people and, and it's become more about that than yeah. and that's kept me accountable yeah because it does because I can't go back on the stage telling a load of lies yeah um and um, or changing either you know I see so yeah. many people that that don't remain as humble as in the beginning you know like and I try to keep the ego out of it and think well you know i just need to be raw and remind myself where i've come from and i'll tell you how i came across you was your youtube video right and i'm gonna put the link on the show notes for people to see because you are such a lovely bloke and so honest and genuine and in that video is proof of your story and there's pictures of you where your weight's heavier and where you are now and it inspired me, and we're very similar, but listening to you is like g- give me goosebumps because of how you've turned your life around so much. And that has a knock-on effect to people around you, your wife, your children, you know, and we all got, got regrets of the past, right? Yeah. But w- what can we do about that apart from be the example we are now? And And you are. And, and I want people to watch this video and look at your website and, and see what you're doing. And hopefully that will put a nugget of thought in people's minds that go, do you know what? If he can do it, I can, you know, and that's what it's all about. And it? yeah. And, and I always, and I always say to people, you know, when it comes to the keynote speaking, um, I kind of lay it out at the beginning of, of, of what I say is, you know, and and if if a company comes to me or a person comes to me and says, "Will you do your keynote speak?" Uh, I I always say, "Look, I'll do it. I'll do it for free. I'll do it for free because that the getting up there and and talking about it. My goal is always the same. Now is if I can help one person, yeah, one person, and it, and and if this podcast only affects one person, yeah, you know, the transformative effect of dealing with whatever the trauma is whatever the the the, the feelings are de- dealing with that in in a in a way that it, through sobriety um or, or or whatever it is you're addicted to um is is the most epic journey it's yeah. it's not easy it's it's definitely not easy but there's people out there that are going to help you whether it's podcast books facebook groups coaches there, there are people that are going to help you and i i would just say if if i was given any advice to kind of simon at, at 39 who was who was so ashamed of himself and so just thought that he was a waste of space i just said put my arm around him and say look it's okay mate you can yeah. you can get through this you can do it um and that's that's what i'd say to everyone that's is, powerful is just, yeah, and and also I go further than that is putting your arm around the fifteen year old who just lost his mum. Yeah, and saying, you know, mate, you're in for a hell of a ride, but you're gonna turn it around and you're gonna help thousands and thousands of people, including yourself. You know, and yeah, in a child stuff, I quite often um look back at pictures of myself at fourteen and think, God, you was just so vulnerable and so yeah you know, in such a place of vulnerability where when that lad come over to me with a can of beer and said, try that, mate, no wonder I I lapped it up and gone, you know what? This takes all of this pain away because I don't understand the pain. I don't know how to manage it. And there's no support system there to help me manage it. I'm just on my own with it. And no wonder we all get in trouble with this drug that's so available everywhere you look, you know? Yeah. Um, and I, I think you're amazing, mate. I really do. And I'd love to meet you one day. Uh, and 
Yeah, I'm just going into corporate myself now. I've decided yeah. that the, my limiting beliefs are I can sit here behind the screen and interview people. I can talk on lives on Instagram, but I'm now even going to networking events. I've got one in the morning that I'm going, <laughs> and it's like I want to start going into um, corporate, talking about my story, yeah. helping staff, training staff, and that. And and it's terrifying, but do you know what? That's where, um, when you're sitting in the discomfort, that's where the growth is. And a lot of people would be Massive. surprised to, to hear me say that because I might yeah. come across as confident. But we've all got our weak spots, right? And this is an area that I'm going to start hitting now and, and talking more live rather than behind a camera, yeah. getting myself out there. And that's my new goal. And it feels really scary, but really exciting at the same time. So yeah, when you're telling, yeah, when you're telling me about the the um, Covent Garden thing, it makes me laugh because the first one I did was in a pub, and I was about four months sober, and I'd spent about three days writing notes on my iPad, and I stood there with my iPad, not even looking at anyone, uh, and there was a fireman there that had gone through Grenfell, um, and he come over to me and said, "Mate, your story is so inspiring; it makes me want to stop myself." And that that yeah. one liner was God. What you've been through recently with Grenfell is like that. That might talk, help someone, and then someone else come up, then someone else. So I do, I do, do actually um, speaking. But the story I tell myself is that I hate public speaking. I'm terrified yeah. of it. I, I hate the discomfort it gives me. So it's about learning to sit within that discomfort, which is the goal, not the public speaking, you know? So yeah. we're always on a journey of discovery, no matter how long down the line you are. I look at it as sobriety is my absolute foundation for change. This lay those foundations down, it's solid. And then you build everything on top of that moving forward, you know? Yeah. And as you say, some days you can feel rubbish and a bit down and low and but then you bounce back really quickly yeah. but when you're drinking it it takes so much longer and and it might it does, be a fleeting yeah. moment mightn't it it's that consistent it's that compound consistency effect you know whether it's consistently drinking or consistently not drinking yeah it it it, it compounds the the effect and you know that's that's definitely what I've noticed is is that I'm just able to be better more consistently um yeah. and that's driven that journey so what does the next few years look like for you then what's coming up well, that's a that's a good question I so one thing I've I've really loved um you know through through all of this is is meeting so many inspirational people um and seeing that I started to I, I suppose I wanted to for my for my talk in a way I want I wanted to give something really tangible to people in in my talk and um so I I created almost a, a kind of template um that um if if you like gives gives people a, a template to to start with and I call it the the goal realization equation and weirdly it's modeled on um because I'm in hotels, I always used to love the fire triangle in the training, you know, so it's modeled on the, on the kind of fire triangle. And, and what I tell people to do is to write their goals in the middle. So whatever their goals, because if we write our goals down, you know, the chances of us achieving them are much higher. And then I talk about the people that we surround ourselves. So, you know, if you look at my sobriety and my journey, one thing that's been super important at the bottom of the triangle is actually the people that I surround myself or the people that I stopped surrounding myself with. Mm. So that's really powerful. It's then that at the top of the triangle is the building of these habits, whether it's, you know, it started with a five minute walk, then it's a 10 minute walk, then it's a 15 minute walk. And then the bottom left hand corner of the triangle is, is actually more about resilience and failure and actually knowing that it's okay to fail because if you fail it means you're actually trying to do something and you you you're to analyze that failure and 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 think it's it's not actually failure it's just part of the journey and, and it's about being resilient so I, I kind of put that that triangle together 
And when I started talking to people about their journey and 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 things, I, I recognized that people who had gone on to change or, or made large transformations, whether it was weight loss or sobriety or or even changing jobs and going into a, into a new world, that there was almost this equation was the same for them, this transformation. And so I've I've started a uh, a kind of book journey which which I'm really excited about um, called the transformation effect, and it's about taking those elements whether it's weight loss whether it's whether it's um, um, addiction and and how people transform, and my story is um, is uh, okay it's it's interesting but it's 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 nothing out of the out of the ordinary and. Um, what I realized is the really powerful thing is if I could um, find lots of people who have made transformative journeys and I could put that together in a book and talk to them and ask them questions so that people could read that book and go, right, I relate to that person and I relate to that person. Because on my journey, I just learning from lots of different people, um, I found that there's a book, um, I think it's it's Rich Roll, uh, Finding Ultra, Um and he was, you know, similar to us. At, uh, uh, he, I think he was, you know, he he was even in clinics and and went into proper rehab and and all of that. And his his journey is amazing. And so, learning off all of these people, I, I felt that if I was going to do a book, I'd like other people to share their stories and build that around the the kind of transformation effect. So yeah, so I've got I I'm working on that. I'm doing. Uh, my my speaking and and really enjoying that got a sort of packed calendar and then we talk about uh i guess uh sobriety giving you back time well it's it's given me back so much time i also run a hospitality management company which you know in all honesty i'd fallen out of i i had fallen out of love with hospitality through my drinking and eating and all of that and and i realized quite quickly after i started get, you know getting into a better place i hadn't fallen out of love with the industry i'd fallen out of love with myself and wow. and 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 so i kind of had this second wind but i wanted to make it about human performance and i wanted to make it about uh you know supporting because in hospitality it's rife problems with with alcohol and and drugs and so i wanted to start a company that really uh reflected that and 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 helped um you know uh help give give something back so yeah so i have a a business that that that's running well and i enjoy it and i would never have had the confidence to do that before so yeah it's it's a packed schedule my wife's agreed to another iron man so i've got hopefully that coming up next year Amazing. um so yeah and and you know uh like some of your previous guests i think it was andy stone you know, he's got uh, ambitions to swim the channel and whatnot. And um, yeah, I've got a, a few things up my sleeve that I'm hoping to achieve. That's amazing, mate. So inspiring. Um, and it's also important to say that, you know, like I, I cl climb the mountains and you do that. Andy does the swimming. Ali Bailey does the ultra marathons and whatnot. But you don't need to set those targets. You need to find out what works for you. Yeah. You know, and and what works for you. Um because our, our journey is all different, right? We might yeah. drink the same amount, but based on history, our life, generational stuff, trauma, we're all different and we need yeah. to find out what works for us. And that's what's so amazing about it is that when you find your niche, it just clicks. Yeah. And your whole life can turn around and be amazing. I've um, met, I've met, I've met one guy that, and, and you're absolutely right. Cause it's not all about sport. It's not all about, and and I've met one one chap, um, Charles is his name, and um, he really struggled with alcohol. You know, it wrecked his 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 family life, and his love was painting. So he he loved painting as a as a child, but he kind of didn't feel he was good enough or whatever, and has become a painter and and now is doing brilliantly. So yeah. it, it is about finding what's what's your thing. Yeah, absolutely. Simon, I, I feel like we could talk forever, but I, I try and keep these tight, these interviews. Uh, and it, it's been a joy for you to kick off this new season. You're, you're such an inspirational 
and lovely man. So thank you so much for joining me. Keep us all posted. I'm going to put all your links in the show notes and um, all the best for the future, mate. Great. Thank you so much for having me and thanks for doing this and all you do for people. Thank you, mate.